Our club has always been a forum for public figures, thought leaders, and decision makers to share their ideas. Here, we offer access to dynamic political, business, and public personalities. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paula Allen. I'm a director of the Canadian Club, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous people of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we all call home. To do this, reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between the nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their culture. We're grateful for the opportunity to be able to come together to learn on this land. Today, we host a panel of business leaders for an important conversation focused on the S, the social responsibility aspect of ESG. With increased investor attention on the social factors to help create returns, the S is increasingly material to the bottom line. It's clear that ESG is no longer a trend. It's a core part of business evolution. Before we hear from today's panel, I want to review a few housekeeping instructions. So please take note that if you are having any difficulty with internet, if it's slow, if the quality is not good, you can, you can click on the item that says, click here to switch stream. This should allow you to get the best audio quality. If you have questions, please enter them in the questions window and they'll be sent to the moderator. The request help button is also located on the bottom right of a corner of your page and this is for technical support. I wanna take a moment to also thank today's sponsor, Fieria Capital for making this event possible. Thanks to their generous support, today's event is free of charge. The Canadian Club is a non-for-profit organization and we've been gathering people for 125 years. It's only because of our sponsors, as well as our partners and members that we're able to provide the content and the thought leadership that we deliver each and every day. Now to introduce today's speaker, first, Kevin Bourne. Kevin is the Managing Director and Head of Sustainable Finance at IHS Market. We also have Nori Campbell, who's the Group Head and General Counselor for TD Bank. Mohamed Faki is the President and CEO of Paramount Foods. And Damien Frucart is the Executive Director of Institutional Shareholder Services. We also have the pleasure today of having David Simmons, the Senior Vice President and Global Chief Communications and Sustainability Officer for Great West Life Co. and Canada Life as our moderator. So on to a tradition that the club maintains and has maintained over the first for fast several years. If you have a beverage close to you, please join me in a toast to Canada.
And now I'm delighted to turn things over to our moderator, David. David, over to you. Thanks, Paula. <clears throat> and thanks to everyone for joining us today on such an important topic as we think about the role of organizations uh, in driving ESG uh, across our country. Uh, Every day, and particularly today, given the topic, I'll acknowledge that I'm joining us from the traditional territory, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, uh, and the Wendat people. Um, we are going to have a very uh, involved conversation from what I know of our participants today uh, and, and the roles they're playing in society. I'm gonna ask a few questions. Uh, it is possible for you as an audience participant to ask questions as well, as Paula said, there's a tab at the bottom of your screen. You can type in your question. It pops up to me and to Colleen Kennedy, our executive director, and we run through those. So if our panelists uh, give us the time to, we'll get to, to audience questions, but I know they have a lot to share and they're joining us from a variety of places. Um, I wanted to start with uh, some common definition, if I can. So I'd ask the panel, you know, we hear a lot about ESG. We also hear phrases like sustainability, social impact, corporate purpose. These are increasingly becoming words that are used across boardrooms uh, in, in Canada, the US, uh, and in Europe primarily. Um, can we talk a little bit about what that means to each of you as you think about this agenda and, it move, and, and how it moves forward? Maybe, Mohammed, maybe I can start with you. You're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for having me here today uh, among a lot of great people. Uh, and uh, happy to take a lot of the questions, especially from the audience. Well, for me, for Paramount, we call it differently. We call it the four Ps. Uh, we at Paramount believe that profit is a destination. And how do you get there? And for us is with the three Ps, putting people first, planet and purpose to get to profit. And it's part of our DNA. It's not something that we do because it's the right thing, only the right thing to do. It's not because it's nice to do. It's the way we do business. And we truly believe, and you can ask Colleen that she's not with us today, but before we start this panel, she said that uh, when she was helping with the Syrian refugee, they kept eating at Paramount, all of them, because they saw what Paramount was doing by hiring 150 Syrian refugee. And that was a simple, easy, and thank you, Colleen, for making it easier for me today on this panel to say, it's not only that I think to do and the nice thing to do, it is, but it's the profitable thing to do. And it's something that will increasingly add to the value of the corporation today in today's as a market. And for us, putting people first is very, very important because we truly believe that your employees are your biggest asset. Isn't your brand, isn't your food, is it your banking system, isn't your product only, but your employee is your definitely biggest asset in the world and especially today. And that's what it means to pay off. Thank you for that. Um, Kevin, you're coming from a very different perspective, uh, dealing with capital markets. Do you hear about ESG? What is what is what's that mean, and how do we define that in your space? Uh, it's a, such a broad definition that everyone keeps asking for. Um, I I come I come at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, for the last 250 years, we've enjoyed um, a tremendous change in in what we can achieve socially, globally through industrialization. And in that period, capital markets have developed and they've developed around the provision of financial information. Although there have been some movements looking at non-financial information, there hasn't been anything that's really uh, been material or structured on a global scale. So I now see non-material reporting, not sorry, non-financial reporting, um, ESG as something that is that is long overdue. We've learned through those 250 years of industrialization, that if we don't now change, um, things are going to uh, are going to get worse for us. So for me, non-financial reporting, the provision of information by companies to the market that lets the market assess them from a different perspective, which is just as important going forward, I think is absolutely vital. Um, to, to me, it's about our future. Um, we can't change what we've done in the past, but this for me is a, is a bit of a reset um, you know, we economic growth is good for nations, but we need to have economic growth in a way that doesn't continue to damage the most important resource we have, which is our environment. It's interesting you mentioned uh, uh, perform economic indicators and sort of how we measure. And Damien, I know you work with shareholders across the market to sort of measure these things. So when you hear that, what what how would you define ESG or talk about that with with your uh, colleagues, partners, customers? 
that's that's a great question. I would say that uh, we would speak to, uh, to to three different clients and uh, come up with four different definitions as to what ESG is, and it really depends on what it is that they're particularly interested in. What we've observed over the last few years is uh, is, is a huge uh, interest in uh, in climate. Uh, but before that, when I joined the space, there was a lot of interest in uh, in, in human rights and in uh, contro- controversy screening. Um, but what what we have observed as time has wore on is uh, more and more sophistication in uh, what is expected, um, and now investors no longer really expect us to just provide a rating or a score or you know some kind of measuring system to uh, to, to compare companies, but to provide the raw data, the granularity that they need to make their own in house. Um, measurements of companies according to whatever it is they're interested in, including, we, we have, as I said, we have in, investors who are mostly interested in, in climate change, but we also have uh, clients who really look after uh, pension funds. Um, so they have much more sustainable long-term perspective of what it is that they want. They want a company that will still be around in five, 10 years time and that will grow. Or we have also relationships or clients who are trade unions and that for, from their perspective, what they're interested in is really whether or not the companies they're invested in uh, have um, labor rights policies, freedom of association and the such, because they consider it to be also um, a reputational risk. Nori, I left you for the end on purpose. Um, you have a broad portfolio. Paul, I mentioned your group head and general counsel at TD. So you, I, I don't want to make assumptions, but I'll assume you view this both from an operating perspective as some of its responsibility for ESG, but you're in a highly regulated industry, multiple markets, multiple business lines, uh, a variety of different uh, group heads who are running P&Ls across the business and looking to you for advice and leadership on this. So I just heard three very, um, I could thread them together, but three different perspectives of what we're talking about. So given your seat, uh, how do you define that? And how do you think about about this work? Well, uh, thanks, David. And it's such a pleasure to be here and and with this great panel. And I know we're here to talk about the S, so maybe I'll go right to it, to social. And I think it makes a lot of sense to start on definitional. Um, So we, if we, we step back from it, maybe sort of where Mohammed was, our CEO, Barrett Mazrani, he talks about banking. It's a people business. Uh, he, that You're in the relationship business. You're in the business of building trust. And, and so, of course, social or, or people is right at the heart uh, of, of what we do. And it's not something you can do one day and then put it in the bank, if you'll pardon the pun. It's really something that is the result of a million different uh, interactions by our 90,000 colleagues. And so what becomes very um, important is, do they know what matters within your organization? And I think people have come to talk about that in the, in the context of purpose. What's the purpose of your organization? And, and we say to enrich the lives of our colleagues, our customers, and our communities. And so I think a lot of the work around um, social has focused in on inclusion, on, on diversity and inclusion. And so to say just a couple words about that at at TD. So we started our diversity and inclusion journey, you know, a couple of decades ago. I've been very lucky to be at the bank for 21 years. And I think when we started, we said the most important thing is to work on culture. And, you know, that may not be where everyone went first. You know, there's um, obviously lots of need to drive representation and and think about this uh, from a numbers perspective. But we started with what I think is the heavy lift and and worked on culture. And then through the phases of uh, our work, we also turn to leadership accountability. And then I, ha- I had the very great pleasure of leading our inclusion and diversity work. And when I did, um, you know, we, we started to figure out that we'd spend a lot of time focused on our colleagues, you know, definitely making um, um, statements and being part of the dialogue outside the bank, but really a employee focused piece. And that that was no longer enough even for our colleagues. Our colleagues were saying, I can hear a dissonance. If you're not standing for what you say when you're recruiting me, when you're dealing with our customers, that does not work for me. And I think that's an amazing challenge. Uh, It's coming through our people. And so we've broadened out our diversity and inclusion work to customer, colleague, and community, just like our our purpose. And I say that not to, to focus in on the bank at all, but more to say, 
I do think as we embark on social as a much broader topic than uh, diversity and inclusion, because it will go to many things, many of which have been um, mentioned by the panelists, uh, you need to think about what is it that gets your organization going? You know, so I like to draw on our diversity and inclusion uh, journey to say, how is it that we engage 90,000 um, TD bankers? And, and we learned a lot as, as we worked on diversity and inclusion. We learned that you need to change the culture, make sure that people know what you stand for, uh, and make sure that people know that they make a contribution to, to how we, um, we will be successful. So I think this idea of how are you mobilizing your organization uh, to really get things done. Um, so I talk about it, you say, ESG can't be the icing. ESG must be the cake baked in at every layer of the organization. I'm sorry, David, I can't do sports analogies, so I have to do food analogies. So, <laughs> so, so this is my uh, my work is, is, is to the point that you're making. How do we build this cultural change within the bank, and then how do we embed it in everything that uh, that we're doing, and really lead with our business, uh, not just the, uh, a, a part of the bank working on it. Yeah, no, I think that's a really uh, helpful insight. That, that it's got to be fundamental to the way we approach it. Mohammed, you shared uh, at the opening um, a reference to Colleen, our colleague uh, who, who uh, engages in your products at Paramount. I, I love them too. I might head up there after this for lunch. Uh, and, and, please do, uh, please do. I will, I will. I've made a commitment to public <laughs> one. <laughs> Make you match for me on that. Uh, you're very well known in, in the GTA and increasingly across Canada for the advocacy work that you've done, lending your voice to uh, justice for, for immigrants to Canada, uh, the crisis that's happening around the world, and Canada being a home for, for, for newcomers uh, who, can, who can work hard and, and, and make, a, make a future here. How have you, how did you make that? Did you make that decision? How did you make that decision? I know there's a lot of, probably a lot of people around who think, you know, why is Muhammad doing that? And, and how did he get to that? So talk to me a little yeah, bit about um, and when is he going? When is he going to run for politics? Right. Well, so uh, we, that's my follow-up question. <laughs> well, uh, that's not what's happening, and uh, I, I truly believe uh, business people, CEOs, uh, leaders in our community need and to be vocal about issues that are involved and touch our communities, and without wanting something from it. And clearly, we're not used to that. Uh, I don't do it because I want to run. For politics, I do it because it impacts people like me 20 years ago when I came poor to this country and people wouldn't hire me just because I have an accent or my name is Mohammed or because I wasn't welcome in one way or the other. And I do understand, and I, I, that's a good way to ask you, uh, I, do you prefer that conversation where we actually jump on the question or comment while others from the panelists are talking or you just want to organize it in a question answer basis because I, I i agree with everyone on a lot of things that they said but it's not only that like i i i heard when we say it's a reputational risk and to manage that for shareholder but i think that's a conversation that we all had and i heard it 10 years ago and 15 years ago and 20 years ago today we need to be at a stage where we understand that without the S in ESG companies evaluation are going to go lower comparing to other company that they actually believe and they do business that way. So it should not be part of only one part. It's all of the above together. It's the right thing to do. It's the nice thing to do. It's what we should be reporting to our staff because our employees today are the, like staffing our companies today is the biggest challenge to all of us and to attract employees today, uh, the, the staff and the good skills and good talents are expecting from us to put them in a company that makes, um, makes them proud and they will become part of something bigger than ourselves. And that's purpose. Purpose does that. And when we do it the right way and for the right reason, our company's values will actually go up. So <laughs> there was a deal uh, on the table for Paramount to sell. And the people did a, a legal research and did a financial research. But when they went to the market to ask about Paramount, they understood that they better off to pay Paramount more for Paramount shares because it would be more difficult to build a company with such a reputation where we have a full support of the community 
and where people prefer to spend their money in PMO. So why go build another one? Let's buy them at a higher price. When we start believing that will increase the value and will impact the bottom line, it will not become something that will do because it's the nice thing. It will be definitely in some cases a reputation or risk management, but we, it should be the way we do business. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot to take from your comments, particularly the increasing um, uh, value of, of, of reputation and how that stands over time and can accelerate value creation inside and outside the company. Nori, you mentioned um, being at the bank for some time. I think I'll, I'll call it um, so that, that you know, observers, your colleagues in the financial services industry often look to TD as a pay setter uh, in a number of these spaces, particularly the DNI space, when your former CEO moved the bank very openly and publicly to support the 2SLGBT community. It was, it was seen as a disruptive play. It was, you were one of the first major FIs to do that. And you followed in a number of areas. One of the things that we've chatted about uh, in other forums is that you've got to make choices when you do when you prioritize the S and ESG, right? You can't necessarily solve for everything. How, do you, how does the bank and think about and what advice can you give us as you make that choice go through that choice cascade to say, where can we have the most impact and what matters most to us uh, in this dialogue? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think it's a, it's a really important question. I sort of think of it in three words, maybe um, purpose, opportunity, embed. So maybe just to, to tell you, and it, it leaves off where Mohammed was too. I think on purpose, um, and, and maybe as, as Kevin and Damien were saying, there are a lot of possible topics under ESG. And so uh, you, you do need to choose what it is you're going to make a, a difference. Um, and so if you think of it, um, if you're a beverage company, maybe it makes sense to pick clean water. It's, but when you're a financial institution, as, as, as we are, um, economic and financial inclusion makes a lot of sense as a spot that you would uh, spend your time. In. And there's obviously lots that we can do under that. And what that permits is that you can actually lead also with your business. Um, and that goes to the long-term sustainability and, and ability to get traction. I think to the point um, that Mohammed was making on the second word on opportunity, you know, we've uh, looked a lot in the past at um, ESG as a risk management or, um, uh, you know, you want to be on an indice or you want to have uh, other indicators of your leadership in it. But when you look at it as, a, as an opportunity, I think that that's a really important part of driving the sustainability of your work. And I, I can't say it better than Mohammed just said it, so, so I wouldn't try. But, but I do think if, if we thought about the E, for example, the environment part of it, you know, we know the world is going to go through a massive transformation. So we need to not only manage the risk of that, but we need to play our part in propelling that transformation. And I can tell you that, it, you know, the best part for me leading the ESG strategy is to see our business leaders, um, you know, open up and really be exploring this opportunity side of, of ESG. On, on the embedding, I really think... <laughs> that, um, like if you think about a complicated place like the bank, um, you know, you could make a lot of really great statements from a chair like mine, but what really matters is how do you make sure it actually happens? So, so I see a big transformation in people's discussion about ESG going from why, which I think everyone is just recognizes now, and more into how. And so to me, this question of how do you embed it in your major strategic making um, decision places so that it um, is in your risk management policies so that your frontline knows what you want them to do when they're interacting with customers. So so to me, the neat work, if you take a, you know, too many acronyms, uh, it's like, how do you make ESG BAU? That's the big lift. That's what we're working on uh, right now. This, that's our, our, our most important work to really get to our ambitions around ESG. I love that. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that, Nori, just to, just to you. Um, um, Kevin, I, I'm thinking about you. Know, last year we had COP26. People came out of COP26 with a bunch of commitments. There's a lot of dialogue about sustainability being a currency or a performance indicator, a metric of success. Um, is that? I'm gonna just call it. Is it real? Should, like, are we? Are people like you actually sitting and saying this is an equivalent indicator for success to financial metrics? Now, what are your thoughts on that? The answer is yes, it is. Um, and depending on the data point you look at, the signal strength varies. 
some of the signals from a quantitative point of view are very obvious. And in that respect, they're no difference at all to normal financial metrics. Some of the others are more qualitative, um, but they are they still lead indicators? I think they are. I think how companies behave, um, their, their perspective on their impact on society, not just society in their own country, but society in other countries where their business um, touches the population, I think is extremely important. Um, I would want to see a CEO understanding that and realizing it and having it as part of their DNA, even though it is difficult with some of the social metrics to say, we do X and it equals Y, that's not the point. Um, it, it, this is very, it's a very interesting discussion for me because in, in one respect, I see Canada absolutely leading the world in this. And it's an unusual um, uh, incident that happened just over a year ago. We, we um, got to meet and started working with the Toronto Exchange. And they said, we want to set an example to other exchanges around the world, um, not necessarily on a commercial basis. We think we have an obligation to show what we can do as an institution and lead, because we think if we don't, as a major exchange, how are others ever going to follow? And we said, OK, what would you like to do? They said, we'd like to get all the Canadian companies, even the small ones, involved in ESG. Not just the E, not just the G, but the S component as well. Um, will you work with us and get and, and help us with some technology, which we which we've been doing incredibly um, exciting um, project with them now, with over uh, two hundred and fifty Canadian companies directly involved. And now, for me, from a social point of view, although it's in industry, other exchanges around the world saying, "What's Canada doing? That's really interesting." Uh, why are they doing it? And, and other exchanges wanting to join the program. So I see it happening at many levels. Was it, was it a commercial project with, um, with the Toronto Exchange and us? No. I would say it was motivated by the, um, by the, by the social desire of the exchange to say these, these issues are important and we must lead. And they've certainly done that. So does that make it a lead indicator for their Financial returns? Probably not. Does it make an extremely important effort by a public and well-known organization? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's interesting. And John has been very vocal about uh, moving the, the TSX to a place where it can engage in those dialogues. Mohammed, does that hold true in, in a privately held company? Um, do you see the same urgency or acceleration uh, in your peer set uh, around measuring or quantifying the, the, could, the value? I couldn't stop nodding my head when Kevin was speaking, <laughs> but the last part of it, I would, uh, I would add to it that it should be a financial indicator and it should be because uh, at the end of the day, our customers and our employees are coming from the communities we support. And more we support them, more they're going to ask for, uh, uh, show their loyalty and support back. So it should affect the bottom line. And uh, definitely, I agree, Canada has an opportunity to lead the world in kinder capitalism. Yes, kindness and capitalism could come, could go together as two words. I truly believe in it. I'm a capitalist myself. I, I own the companies. I mean, people know me, Mohammed from Paramount. I own uh, a building company. I own a roofing company. I own different companies, including a consulting firm. But the, at the end of the day, it's all about the community that you support and their loyalty back to support your companies and what you do. Our roofing company, when I launched it after London and Windsor Success, launched it in Mississauga and Oakville, and we already have many, many, many jobs just because of the work we do with our uh, community, not because they have seen how great we are as a roofing company yet. But the bottom line, and most importantly, there is an urge everywhere and across the board of people stop putting their face on the back of a bus to sell a shawarma sandwich or a burger, but actually feeding that burger and sandwich to people in need and can afford it, where they will actually have a lot of people supporting your companies just because they see you doing good in the community. And another very important point that I think it's important when uh, the Flight 752 fell and I went to uh, fundraise for the Iranian Canadian community, a lot of CEOs said, we do not want to get involved. It might be very political. What happens in our community, what happens to all our fellow Canadian is a Canadian issue that involves CEOs, involves everyone, and CEOs could actually lead Canada and demand from the politician to act better and to show the rest of the world and lead the rest of the world with this kind of capitalism where 
whatever impact every single one of us in the street impact us as CEO, as companies as well. No, that's really powerful. Damien, how do we, how do we do that? Like, you know, we're talking about it. You know, I think if we listen to Muhammad's called leadership, it should be an indicator. It should be right there next to, to the bottom line. How do we do that? Like how do, how do we measure and, and, and quantify? Is there a standard? Should there be a standard? <laughs> um, yeah, um, this is, uh, this is, increasingly part of the conversation isn't it uh, there's uh, when uh, when the tcfd came and i i realize this is this is a climate issue and we really want to to focus on on the social one but so this is purely anecdotal but when the tcfd came out with its uh, expectations of uh, disclosure on uh, climate uh, in uh, the regulatory disclosure, so annual reports, there was a lot of pushback from uh, from many in- issuers because, of course, as soon as you put it in the annual report, it becomes uh, it becomes a material risk. Um, but at the same time, there is uh, th- there is a lot of uh, momentum towards uh, integrated reports, which um, encourage companies to to basically provide all kinds of ESG data. In their uh, in their annual reports, so now they are also presenting diversity data, um, turnover rates, um, and, and and various employee satisfaction uh, data points as well. And there they will also try to uh, to talk about their the social license to operate that uh, that that they have, presenting that as a, a, a as something that can help them. Um, Generate more uh, more more income by being more acceptable where they decide to uh, to, to to plow the business. Mm-hmm. Nori, uh, you serve with a, a number of colleagues uh, on a council called the Sustainable Finance Action Council here in Canada, um, and I know that in the, at least in the financial services industry, we're having conversations about consistency or, or a standard of reporting that would be helpful given some of the dynamics Damien's mentioned around materiality. Can you give us your perspective on uh, the good? I mean, I think you've said it before, the E, the S, and the G are all positive things. They're good things in business that we should be thinking about. That doesn't mean that they won't be a conflict with one another. So can you sort of reflecting on that statement and then on the work we're doing, you're doing particularly on dialoguing with policymakers around a standard how do we reconcile the potential conflict in reporting mm-hmm. that that could be created? Yeah. I, um, so maybe just to elaborate a little bit on the point that you're making, um, like to me, you know, a lot of very good work has gone on to do more, say more, uh, be more transparent, accountable, measurable on um, environment, social and governance. Uh uh, but I do think there is a next shoe to drop here, and that is that you can be um, making uh, assertions under ES and G. All of them would be good, but some of them can't both be accomplished at the same time. So, so I sort of say E, environment done not well, is your S issue of tomorrow. And so that's why we're in trying to support, you know, um, a responsible transition in, in Canada so that you have the least impact to workers and communities and all the things that that could come out of um, uh, not taking all that in, into account on the way through. In reporting, I think there's also a conflict um, because if you think fundamentally, I think we will make the most progress on environment, social and governance initiatives if each organization can look uniquely into itself and say, hey, like, what is my great contribution to solving these societal problems? Where can I add the most value? So that sort of drives you down a uniqueness path. And yet, rightly, uh, Damien and Kevin and others and uh, our stakeholders are looking for an ability to compare us um, to our peers and other because they're deciding, am I investing in your company? Am I uh, coming to you to do your business? And so that's driving you towards comparability. And so I think that what we need to do as we work our way through this is solve for both. You know, we want to be able to let people, companies find their own unique way to make a contribution but at the same time, we do need to get to some standardization. And there's some very good work underway. I can see that uh, resolving. Uh, so, so I think that that's um, uh, quite an important uh, part of it as, as, we, as we move forward. I, I think as, as, as this all <laughs> sort of comes together, you know, what, what we want is to continue to keep people engaged on um, environment, social and governance. I know that 
there was a little bit of a feeling at the beginning of the pandemic, would we lose some momentum? We had some very good momentum. Would we lose the momentum? And of course, we know the ending to that story now. No momentum was lost. In fact, it, it resulted in, in, if anything, um, you know, increased uh, momentum. So, so to me, the the um, opportunity here, and I think others have done a great job of expressing it, is like seizing that part. So I'll just finish on saying on the Sustainable Finance Action Council, I have the pleasure of leading the technical expert group focused on disclosure. And one of our key goals is can we champion tools for Canadian issuers or companies that are doing their ESG disclosure to make it as cost effective and efficient as possible. And, and Kevin's given a great example of the TMX showing leadership on that element, because if it's um, simpler to do, it's easier to ask corporates to do it. Mm, that's a, that's a powerful, that's a powerful close on that point, Nori. Um, where does the, so Damien's mentioned the materiality that, that's created through reporting. I think Nori's given us good perspective on the, the, the things that go in that basket. Does it, where does governance come into this? Like, how do we, how do we, because if you think about traditional shareholder responsibility or traditional sort of shareholder accountability, it's clear how you sort of uh, design governance structures and oversight structures to do that. When we think about the S and ESG, I mean, Nori, you've talked about each, each, private sector players sort of finding their the authentic spot to make an impact. If all of us are taking different authentic spots to take an impact, then how do you design governance systems that that do effective oversight? Like if, if I was at Paramount, it would be different than TD or Canada Life. Or So how do you do that? What, what's the board's responsibility? And is there a consistent approach to this? And any of you who, who, who want, you want to jump in here on that? Well, I'm happy to start and then uh, maybe others uh, sure. want to join in. Um, so, so I think that the, um, in many ways, the environment piece of this has been aided by greenhouse gas emissions becoming one of the main measurements of progress. And on S or social, there are some like that. Uh, we obviously know that um, you know there's a lot of interest from every stakeholder on your um, progress on diversity and inclusion. So, so there are some, but to your point, there it's not as um, um, widespread yet or it doesn't coalesce around a single uh, measurement because different companies like Mohammed's company, my company will be, be looking at different initiatives. And so I think that is something to get solved as, as we move forward. And it may be that you only want to compare within peer groups in any event, and, and that might help solve it as we go. I think the board point is a really interesting one. So maybe just to spend a, a minute on that and then let my colleagues um, speak also. I mean, the board is absolutely critical to uh, environment, social and governance journey there um, on all the things that, you know, boards are important for uh, setting tone, being, um, you know, uh, helping you make your strategic decisions. If you think of the board as having, a, you know, the absolute authority on the approval of a, of a corporate strategy. Like for us, I think when we step back, we feel in many ways, you know, environment, social and governance um, is who TD has been. It is who we are. You know, we've thought a lot about long term shareholder value has always been the way that we have felt we would be successful. We need to care about so many stakeholders. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning. We're in the people business. If you don't uh, keep your eye on all of that, you will not have a franchise in the long term to um, to, to protect. So, so I think that the board, you know, with the, as an ability to always be, a, you know, a overseeing you, having that ability to stand back from the day to day, they can really help you uh, drive that. I think that the thing that um, I just want to emphasize for people, if we go back to that, I find now people want to talk more about how to do it than why is it is a heavy lift for your board. I think you have to be very um, conscious of how you're asking them to take on these obligations. So, so for example, for us, um, you know, there's elements of ESG we'd always worked on. So we took a step back and said, how should they lead this going forward? We made a purposeful decision. We're not going to pull everything ESG related into one committee. Committees have their own very unique ways that they think about the organization, unique expertise. So if you take, for example, risk management, um, you don't want to pull all the need to think about physical and transition risk into a single committee at the bank. So we gave each committee very defined um, responsibilities, and then we bring it together at our corporate governance committee. And the reason I say that is that did actually mean you had to go back through kind of the 
way that this all works at the bank. And then you had to think about all the ways that um, the rest of the bank feeds into the board process. So, you know, I think that um, people should recognize as they're evaluating companies that are working on this, it, it's it's a lot of work and it needs to be a lot of work to get there because we're changing, um, you know, we're changing the way that business is interacting with some of these major um, issues that are in society. And so taking a step back, rethinking, thinking, how do I build this in? How do I embed it through my major processes in the in your organization is, is a big part of success here. Other comments? Um, yeah, can I jump in? I, I, it's very interesting to very interesting to hear Nori and Mohammed talk about this. There clearly there are many companies where the boards want to get this done. Unfortunately, there are some still that don't. I, I find it difficult to believe that boards of directors don't want to get this um, uh, issue dealt with and to do it properly. I just think for many of them um, that there's a learning curve uh, to go on. Not just in Canada. This is a global issue. And when you, when we talk about governance. Um, I think boards generally are pretty good at governing themselves and there are rules and conditions in place through society that help them achieve that. What I am seeing and what is particularly interesting is the role now of regulation in, in imposing ESG. Um, rather than it being a voluntary thing that companies do because they think it's right, I think we're in the middle of a journey where, um, a re where ESG reporting becomes a regulatory issue globally over the next five to 10 years in, for, for all companies, public and private, in almost all countries. Uh, and that's that's very interesting because it's not we're going to regulate E because climate change is the biggest threat. The regulators I work with are saying it's E, S and G. We want to make sure that, that this opportunity is not wasted to address some of these issues and to help companies that need the help um, work through this. You know, most, most companies... Um, certainly all the ones I've worked with are very keen to do this. For, for a lot of them, to Nori's point, it's about actually how do we start the journey, not is it a journey we should be on? Because I think all companies inherently understand, because uh, I run by smart people, that if we don't look after our people, as, as both the other speakers have said, what have we actually got? I, I, and I agree. I mean, uh, but what I'm, when I'm listening uh, to all the speakers, and, and I understand, look, I handle much a smaller number of shareholders, but it's uh, all about the questions until when and until what limit you do it. And I always uh, believed all along that when you want to make a difference and bigger change, you do it until it hurts. So when our revenue dropped uh, during the pandemic by 95% over one night during the worst months of the pandemic, our accountant and CFO showed up to the door here and they're saying, this is a list and these are the people you're going to let go. And I said, no, not one single glass of milk will be removed from the table of anyone who served in Paramount. And definitely you have, and you can expect shareholders saying, what are you saying here? And I said, no, we're going to hold on to our team members. And these are the biggest asset that we've ever had and we will ever have. And we're going to wait until some reliefs and the program shows up for us. And even when the relief arrives from the government and we play the big role advocating for that, we did a top up for our staff. So we maintained the promise of not removing a single glass of milk uh, from in front of them. And that was a very difficult time. But we didn't do only that. We actually lowered the price of food in our menu because we realized Canadians needed to buy more with their money because a lot of them were in a period of uncertainties. And let me tell you, we reached the sales of before COVID, especially in the suburb, so fast, because people realize that this is a company supporting the community and they want to support it back. So it's always that question, because it seems like ESG is coming to our bigger processes. Yes, but it should be as well. ESG is the way we do business. And uh, shareholders need to realize if they want their company to grow and from value point of view and skills and bring in assets, which is the staff and better staff and maintain them, re retention <laughs> programs that we have will work much better when we show our staff that we're good not only when it's convenient, but when it's hard as well. And we're good to the environment, we're good to our 
society, to our community. And that's how it should be. And we understand that shareholders don't understand that way. CEOs has a big role and they need to play that role. And they need to explain to the shareholders and to the board how important that, if the board did not know about it, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was very difficult for me to sell some of my ideas. Today, they're ready to take them. They're trying to push back a little bit, but I think 10 years from today, and I hope less than 10 years, they'll be coming to me to say, let's do more and more because it has to be part of our PNL, has to be part of our reporting, and has to be the part of the way we do business not something coming to our business, just as simple as let's look good or it's a way to protect us. It should be the way we do it. That's the way it is. Mm-hmm. I'm getting, I, I, I remind the audience, you can ask questions using the submit a question tab at the bottom of your screen. And we are getting a, a lot of questions. I'm going to try to be thematic in capturing some of the questions here. Damien, sorry, did you want to make- Yeah, no, sorry. I was just uh, going to, to comment. I'm delighted to, to hear that there is uh, so much uh, support among among my colleagues for the, the importance of uh, governance in uh, environmental and social considerations. In a sense, in in many countries, it is a matter of legal compliance as well to, to have certain uh, environmental and social uh, issues within 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 governance for example uh boardroom diversity is uh is a necessity within uh, within some countries having uh a, a, a trade union representative sitting at the board d- discussions is also another one um but we are observing that more and more there are uh, other items levers of comp- of governance that are coming into play when it comes to the uh, to, to to social issues uh it's it's in- we're seeing increasingly for example executive remuneration being linked to uh, to the health and safety data KP- and kpis um and these are certainly strong uh strong incentives for the people at the top to uh to, to drive a better policy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. one of the questions that are there's a few in here around the relationship between governments and the private sector uh, and policymakers and sort of how sectors will often deal with a regulator or or sometimes there's a phrase in here govern themselves and what the right approach what should be the right balance for canada as we move forward i'm not sure if anyone has a, a thought on that given the intersection here and the one question particularly calls out because of the local nature of social issues so some social issues are I, national. I, I and i heard it from as well today several times i think uh, ceos and companies can lead the way uh, <laughs> We know there is some lack of leadership and a lot of leaders in politics. But during the pandemic, we have seen leadership and a lot of active leadership coming from regular people, a lot of CEOs, a lot of companies. I think CEOs and companies can lead the way and make it difficult for politicians not to make it a regulation. But I don't think we should wait for them to realize how important it is, especially when it's based on vote or donations. I think CEOs could lead the way Companies could and should lead the way only for the fact how interested we are into attracting people, great people to our companies and attracting support from our communities. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts? Yes. I was going to say, normally I don't talk about politics because my wife's a politician and it just gets me into trouble at home. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'd say normally I'd pass it, but this time because I'm in very polite company, um, in a country I like, and I'll I'll jump in. Um, I I think um, of one of the challenges for politicians in most countries, and the, the regulators particularly that I work with, is the speed of change we're going through at the moment. Um, if you think about um, reporting, there's more than a hundred voluntary reporting standards around the world um, that have that are broad ESG reporting frameworks, and they've arrived from nowhere in less than ten years. Now, um, uh, uh, to Damien's point, there's always been local regulations on things like pollution or on gender diversity or on supply chain in certain countries, human rights, but not broad ESG. So I think that I think the politicians are at the moment now starting to understand that they do need to engage on this subject, that there is a big structural change taking place with, to Nori's point, with the big driver of climate change behind it, which they can't avoid. And climate change ultimately is a social issue. If the mean average temperatures change, many people's areas where they live in, as you experienced in Canada with the heat dome last year, 
suddenly become untenable. That becomes a political issue fairly quickly. So I think politicians now are realizing they have to understand, they have to engage, and they have to work hand in hand with business. Otherwise, they simply won't be able to deal with the scale and complexity of these issues in a time frame that really helps everyone. May I add one thing, David? Yes, please. So you'd mentioned before the um, uh, that the bank's participating in the Sustainable Finance Action Council, because I wanted to say um, this is a spot where collaboration, like I think there's lots of jobs to get done by everyone. So so saying somebody doesn't have a job doesn't make sense to me. I think that we, we need to be uh, working together to solve some of these big challenges. And what I just wanted to say that I think that the structure of the Sustainable Finance Action Council is uniquely good, you know, and that was... Uh, that we have lots of financial services players involved instead of just banks or just insurance companies or, or just pension funds. They're all at the table um, together. And then in, in, in what the um, government uh, designed, they attached the official sector's working group to the Sustainable Finance Action Council so that you have Bank of Canada, OSFI, the securities regulators um, working together. So, so I think we're also making a lot of progress on what are the structures of um, getting this collaboration that must occur uh, working. I think that's a really good call out that, you know, we, we are often path making in this space, given the emerging issues. And to Kevin's point, the speed of change that's happening. And there's an opportunity for us to be equally uh, inventive or creative in the policy frameworks that we pull together to get the right solution makers at the table. So I think that's a very good call out, Norian. We probably want to see that echoed across a few policy areas. Damien, did you have any thoughts? Um, no, I, to be honest, I, I feel a little bit, uh, yeah, unable to, to really comment on the uh, on the Australia. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, the, the Canadian uh, situation. It's Kevin's accent. It's a little tricky. You can't really place it. Is he Australian? Is he from the UK? <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's all part of it's all part of the the game. Let me ask you this question. Um, and and you you know I think Damien, you and Kevin see this from companies you may engage with or evaluate. And Nori and Mohammed, you offer products. There's a there's a belief, and you know we are in our own reflection process in the company I work in. There's what we can do as a market player. And then there's what we do at, within the company for our workforce and, and then extending that into products. Is, is the work, is workforce become table stakes? Is that become sort of a um, yes and? And do we need to be thinking about product offering? Do we need to be thinking about the S and the way that we service customers? You know, and, and is that possible at, across segment? Like how, do we, how do we think about that as we go to market? Should we be changing the way we offer products or who we offer them to or what that looks like if we're going to be true to the S and ESG? I, I would say that uh, that is the, the principal challenge and why uh, environment has been given such a, such a strong focus, to be honest, is because it's easy enough to, uh, to, to measure environmental metrics. Uh, you know, pollution can be measured, uh, impact. You, GHG emissions can be uh, can be measured when it comes to, uh, to to social issues, both within the company in terms of employees, but also the impact that we have on uh, on, uh, on on customers. That becomes much more tricky. Um, you know, we we do have the odd marker, but they're not really transferable or comparable from company to company. So, for example, you know, um, vehicle recalls for uh, for you know auto manufacturers uh we can have issues related to you know lawsuits related to uh to you know food poisoning and such for for retailers but this it, it it is it is a bit difficult to to join together all of these disparate data points and metrics into something that's that's consistent i think we are slowly getting there and i think that we you know uh, we can thank uh international standards like uh like SASB uh that help us in that direction we have the gri that do give us a bit of an idea of what kind of metrics we can use um across across companies but we are again we are limited still to uh, to, to what kind of industries these different companies operate in I'd love to add, David. I, so I, I 100% agree with you in the sense of it must absolutely uh, be uh, how you interact with your customers and the services. And 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 I think if I could just say, um, <laughs> colleagues younger than me uh, uh, are absolutely demanding that if they hear a dissonance between um, what you say about 
them uh, wanting to have colleagues within your organization and what you're doing, they 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 won't put up with that. And I think that's amazing. I think that's a, that's a yeah. that's a very good thing. I'm not saying only. I'm sure many many people are are, are like that too. And and so. Um, I think that the thing I do want to say is there's still lots of work to be done within organizations. So, so I would not say people are ready to claim victory there either, but I think that, that we must be doing both and they will self-reinforce uh, and that will be a very good outcome. So, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm on customer, colleague, community. You must be acting out your ESG work across all three. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 it cannot be like uh, like we have a different conversation internally than we speak to the customers or the way the product speaks to others. And uh, no, I, I I see a way to measure actually. Uh, I I I kind of a new way of measuring. Uh, you measure by talking and uh, understanding from your HR department why people are leaving and why people are coming. And when we put the homeless in hotels. Uh, in 2017, I took from Tim Hortons three executives uh, because simply they saw what we do in the community and they wanted to be part of a company that that they could be proud of. And I'm not saying we we do more than Timmy's. Timmy's does much more probably than PMA. But people like to see that we are actually hands on. We're right uh, helping people right in the street, and they they came. And I don't know. Uh, and from other uh, companies, some uh, sometimes a lot of people come because. Not only Paramount is a, a good company uh, to work in, but money is not enough anymore for our staff and for our executives. They're demanding more, like the Nori just said. And on the other level, I mean, you simply, we do a lot of, uh, we, we go to the public and we ask, why do they support Paramount? And let me tell you, after the last three years, and especially the last two years of the pandemic, you know, it's probably those 130,000 meals that Paramount cooked when every restaurant was struggling, including us, and we supported the community. That's why the community is supporting us. So there is a way to measure. Definitely, they're not at the international or bigger level of companies that, but but they could become there. When we start this conversation 10, 14 years ago, people laughed at me. They still wanted the Paramount name on the back of a bus to sell a shawarma. And I wanted to actually feed the shawarma to the poor people so I can sell a shawarma. Because I thought when you feed the poor people a shawarma, and when you're responsible of your takeout supply and you actually say to your employee and the same language you use by approaching the customer, people will support you. And we can show that on numbers today. Yeah. Final words to Kevin. Is yeah, that-, that was that was something that Mohammed just said that really resonated with me uh, about employees wanting to be um, proud of the company they work for. I think we can never underestimate that. Norris made this point as well. Um, so social capital inside a business with your staff believing that what you're doing is more than just making the products, I think is absolutely priceless for, for any enterprise at any level. It is one of those intangibles that if you don't have it, um, you definitely, I think, um, uh, 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 miss reaping some tremendous rewards when you do have it. And I think your company can achieve amazing things. Thank you, Kevin, Damian, Nori, Mohammed, for your words today, for your actions in the marketplace. I think there's a lot of takeaways, a lot of lessons. We could continue for some time. Uh, I'm confident leaving this this discussion that we can uh, have purposeful profit in this country and that Canada can certainly lead the way. So bravo. Uh, Thank you for being here. And I'll hand it back over to Paula. Wow, thank you all very much. Kevin, Nori, Mohammed, Damien. Uh, I was personally wrapped at every every moment and, and at every every comment. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I think it's pretty clear and increasingly clear to others that the whole issue of sustainability needs all three components. Governance, absolutely, a staple stakes. The environment, you know, this is the planet where we all live and impacts everything that we do and experience. But the business impact on people and the importance of social investment and social capital, like it's it's pretty impossible to think about truly sustainable businesses and societies without focused attention there. And each of you articulated that, that beautifully. Um, just a few things. I mean, uh, Nora, you, you spoke about the importance of integrating your ESG strategy and in particular your social strategy throughout a business. Uh, you know, Mohammed 
very, very, very passionate uh, explanation of the importance of, of CEOs stepping up and, and businesses really realizing that their investment in their people is not only the right thing to do, but it is financially relevant. It does reap benefits uh, after the fact. Uh, it's, it's something that really defines your brand and how you position in the marketplace. And Kevin and, and, and Damien, absolutely invaluable comments in terms of the trends that are happening out there. You know, Kevin talking about the TSX, both of you speaking about, you know, the regulatory compliance. So thank you all. And David, of course, thank you as well for your ex expert guidance that you deliver always. One other thanks, and actually a few other things. Uh, thanks to our sponsor, Fiera Capital. We certainly appreciate your generous support of the discussion today. And also to our AV supplier, Ben Valkenberg Communications and LiveMedia.ca for making this possible in a virtual setting. We hope you all will review and listen to this uh, recording over again, uh, but we also hope that you'll join us for some upcoming events. On March 3rd, we'll be back in person to host the Honourable Monty McNaughton, Ontario's Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. And again, hope you'll join us. It will be another fascinating discussion. And on March 8th, in celebration of International Women's Day, please join us for a conversation with Raina Lewilman, I need to have lunch, I think, uh, President of, and CEO of Laurentian Bank, uh, Serene DeVillard, Senior Partner at McKinsey, and Dr. Homer Tian, President and CEO of Orange, again, for a, another uh, fascinating discussion. So to learn more about other upcoming events and to explore our website with past content, uh, please go to the canadianclub.org website and browse our rich archive of past events, check out our new and updated membership categories with enhanced benefits at a variety of levels, and also consider becoming a member to support club's work. Again, guests, attendees, thank you for joining us and please stay healthy and safe.